Hello there, hello, 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 hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show. This is episode number 792. It should be 792. If it's not 792, then I apologize. But whatever number it is, it doesn't matter. I'm here live and direct coming at you from an undisclosed location somewhere in the depths of London. And I hope you are back. I hope you are good. I hope you are well. I hope you're well rested, well lubricated, well chilled and all those things in between. I really, really do. How am I doing? Fairly well, all things considered. I'm not going to lie. I'm doing fairly bloody well. All things considered, I'm doing fairly bloody, bloody well. How you guys doing? fairly well cool i'm doing pretty well if you're not watching this video via the youtube video or anything what the hell are you doing make sure you check out my youtube at youtube.com for slash at t-a-z-s at t-a-z-s which is taz and you'll be able to see the video in full i recently got a haircut i recently got a haircut it's been a very long time since i got a haircut i've had my hairs i uh, had my hair my hairs i've had my hair in some very stinky braids for the best part of what a month and a half i didn't take out the braids i washed it quite regularly though which is something that i was told not to do but because i'm a bit of a stickler for hygiene and cleanliness i couldn't walk around with my head unshampooed unconditioned for a month in braids it just would be too stinky so i decided to shamp to shampoo it basically the week after i got my braids on it obviously led to it fraying out a bit and looking very jim jones like but regardless of all of that I really did enjoy I really did enjoy the feeling of having my hair nice and tucked in and I finally I finally understood I finally understood why a lot of my fellow people that I know a lot of my fellow blacks all over the world decide to leave their braids for long I get why girls decide to leave their weaving for ages I get why guys decide to leave their quote-unquote nappy braids for ages when you've got hair the length that I have it gets really annoying having this hair out as you can tell with headphones it doesn't work too great i can't always wear my noise cancelling headphones because the strap stretches out and it makes my hair look weird and when i take it off i have to kind of fluff out my hair again i can't wear snapback hats i can't really wear beanies to make them look good and most importantly i can't wear do-rags do-rags are fucking great they double up as a way to protect your hair and they also are a good way to kind of wear a hat without wearing a hat right and you also get to look a little bit more negroish. and if i need and if there's anybody in the world who needs help to look more negroish is me right i don't look the most conventionally negroish or any help that i can get to make me look like a quintessential it free male and then i can talk the way that i talk i can be into interests i'm into and then surprise people i fucking love it so i kind of lean into it a little bit so i needed i needed that bit of flatness on my head and i'm gonna be honest even though it's a bit long even though the because to be honest the, the thing i hate the most about getting my hair braided is having to sit under the like dryer thing because when the woman braids it i don't really mind how how tightly she pulls my hair i don't really mind the hot comb sort of thing right i don't mind that the thing i hate the most is having to sit underneath that heater with your you know, under that thing for like i don't know it feels like an hour but it's probably 20 minutes i despise having to do that i despise it so much it's so annoying you get all this heat on your head you almost feel like you want to pass out maybe i'm being a bit of a p-u-s-s-y but honestly you feel like you want to pass out you're like oh i want to go home i don't like this anymore so that's the only thing that i really despise i get my hair braided but apart from that i completely understand why people don't take out their braids forever and they let it just look nappy and all discombobulated because oh my god man it's so nice to have my head just like look like a head you know for no for no pun intended um for no weird way to say it there's it's just nice to kind of feel the shape of my head to allow hats to sit on my head without any sort of issue all that stuff is absolutely amazing and i really did enjoy it i'm not gonna lie i enjoyed every part of it and i'm kind of sad now that my hair isn't the way it was anymore unfortunately but i was also happy that i did decide to do something that i don't usually decide to do because i'm lazy and because i'm very set in my ways i decided to venture out to west i went to one of the best barbers that is known to man especially in london which is um f for fade if you don't know about it definitely try check him out they're on instagram and they're great they're legitimately one of the best barbers in london and um i was a bit of a naughty boy in that i booked an appointment with them two appointments in a row and i no showed 
I didn't just book it and then cancel last minute. I no showed, which is a complete faux pas in the appointment booking schedule world, right? So I completely no showed. I really messed up big time. And I was thinking, right, when I was going to the third time, I was going to call them. I was thinking about changing my name. But I'm such a P-U-S-S-Y. I'm such a scaredy cat. When I called and they picked up the phone, I panicked and said my actual name. I was going to give them a fake name so that they could let me on the list, but I didn't. I, and then obviously when I said my name, they passed me to the person who I know showed and he kind of gave me a bit of a telling off and said, oh, that's not cool. What are you doing? Blah, blah. And I had to plead over the phone. I had to beg, which I don't usually do. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm very anti-begging, right? Um, black people have a very long and storied and very checkered history when it comes to begging and pleading and subjugating ourselves. So I don't like to continue that legacy. I don't like to continue any of that trauma. So I do go against begging in any shape or form. That's why one of my older blogs back in the day was stop begging. I'm against all forms of begging. But on that phone, I did beg in a way that I'm very ashamed to say was very embarrassing and I would help that that recording never makes it to the internet in any way shape or form I hope I don't become a big celebrity somewhere and then that recording comes out and everyone hears me begging and pleading for this barber not to excommunicate me not to blacklist me and allow me to have an appointment <laughs> I still managed to book it so everything was fine everything went well I end up turning up there and everything was good but Jesus Christos man I was so embarrassed and it made me realize as well you know I need to stop booking things and then cancelling them last minute it's something that I usually do quite often because I'm just such a stickler for my own time I think my time is most precious and the most important I don't really take other people's time into consideration blah 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 you know the standard super selfish whatever greedy mindset that people have i have that tenfold right of course i'm that kind of person it is what it is what can you do boo hoo boo hoo but it finally did kick me in the ass where i was like you know what now i have to take my lickings it is what it is i rolled up there i was a smart boy though because usually the barber i think he raised the prices now it's like 35 pounds for like a trim in a bid i took 50 with me in cash right i took 50 with me in cash and i handed it over to him at the end i was like hey you gave me a chance like nope you keep that mate you know, I know showed and he, he had a big smile on his face. If there's one way you want to please a black man, especially a barber, tip them way more than they usually get tipped because I don't think even the footballers that go there, even the hip-hop artists, even some of these UK influencers that go to that barbershop, I bet you some of these mofos don't tip that man. So now I tipped him 50 pounds, but you know what's happened now? My, you know what's happened now, my dear listeners? I think I put myself into a corner. I think now I have to continue paying you fifty pounds. <laughs> I don't think I could get. I don't think I could get away with going back to paying thirty five. Do you know what I mean? I've kind of set a precedent now because I no showed for two appointments, and I went to one. I'm gonna have to pay this guy fifty pound for a haircut, which is wild because I'm already traveling forty minutes, fifty like. My life is so crazy. I will travel fifty minutes to get a haircut but I won't go half an hour to go check out a club. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, my prayer is all over the place, but I have to travel 50 minutes there and back, which is all right because I get a chance to read a book. I actually finished um, Britney Spears' autobiography on the train. Absolutely amazing. Love it. Probably do a review of it later. Please bear in that mind. Traveling 50 minutes to go and get a haircut and then having to pay someone 50 pounds for it is a bit wild. But the good thing about it and something that I've noticed over time is that I would much rather pay somebody more travel further just so i can get something done the way i want it done like i don't know about you guys but i dislike and it happened to me recently i had to buy a new laptop because my other one broke and the guy sent me the laptop and when i got it i opened it and the screen had this weird burning effect thing that was happening i googled how to fix it i was like i'm not gonna fix this why should why should i buy a laptop and it's just not working the way it should be working from out of the box so i emailed the guy said send me a fucking replacement and obviously he's gonna send me a replacement but i was like why would you send me something that's faulty like why and why do i have to do the work to fix it like i'm not your employee like you sold me something you're you're, you're providing a service you're a store send me the thing and let me buy it and then our, our fucking deal is done we don't have to keep communicating and i dislike so much when i go to certain barber shops right and you go in there 
and you have to continually keep telling them what you want because they just forget they have like onset amnesia you're like oh i want it this way and then they're cutting you're like obviously he's fucking it up but but you don't want to say something because you don't want to be that annoying customer that's complaining so you just keep it quiet but then you know he's fucking up you know he's doing it wrong you know he's cutting off a bit too much on the side you know he's you know he's fucking up already from the time he touches your skin you can tell because you've had a million haircuts you know when it's going right when it's going wrong the number one test i know when my barber's messing me up is my mustache I always tell them, keep the moustache nice and thick, just trim the bottom and a bit at the top. And whenever they start giving me that flipping Adolf Hitler stash, right? Whenever they give me that that flipping, you know, that fucking pyramid moustache that all black boys like, that's when I know they they they've they've not listened to anything I've said. They just see me, they see my colour, see my face, and they thought, oh yeah, you want that flipping you want that fucking Adolf Hitler bad boy on your flipping moustache. No. I said keep it thick. I don't really ask for much. Like my haircut's fucking basic. Fade on the side, trim the flipping beard, like keep the fucking moustache thick and don't me- don't give me a flipping R&B thing on the bottom here that's it I don't ask for flipping much and these motherfuckers still mess it up so Effa Fade will get all my money because when I give that guy an instruction when I tell him here's what I want he just does it and that's it I don't have to continue talking I don't have to say oh can you do like it just gets done it just gets done that's it it just gets done and oh these days people service it's just down the flipping drain down the fucking drain and they expect more money from you they expect you to lick their it's like brother brother why am i having to do your job why am i having to hold your hand with a haircut what is this why am i holding your hand with a haircut why am i holding your hand with a haircut please brother please brother please why am i holding your hand with a haircut god damn it bro anyway that got done happy with it the one thing i wasn't happy with though the one thing i wasn't happy with though brothers and sisters i went to a caribbean restaurant i went to a caribbean restaurant in west london and it might have been some of the worst food i've ever eaten in my entire life i spent 21 great british pounds on this stuff right and it was diabolical horrendous and downright disgusting how bad this caribbean food was and it almost made me realize why i don't buy caribbean food in london and why i'm very picky about the places i go in terms of caribbean food and why i don't take people's recommendations seriously too because most people don't have good taste most people don't know how to eat most people also just put up with nothing because i'm i've come to the conclusion that there are some people out there especially black people all they eat is black food right cool but it's not the case they're gonna take whatever's given to them they're not really picky they're only going to eat rice and medesu right they're not going to eat anything else so if you if you give them rice and medesu and it's decent and it's in the restaurant setting if you give them you know jerk chicken and it's decent restaurant setting they're not going to worry because they're never going to eat asian food they're never going to eat any other european food they just want african food so they're not they don't really have good quality control because it's just just give me african food just give me caribbean food but because i I'm better than these people and because I have taste right and because I am a, I'm a foodie with a capital F I expect the food to taste good and in my opinion if you fuck up rice and peas if you can fuck up rice and red kidney beans to the point where they don't taste like nothing what's the point of having your jerk what's the point of having your curry goat what's the point of having your mac and cheese What's the point of having anything on your list if you can't do plain rice with red kidney beans? It's like going to an Asian restaurant. I don't know if you guys have noticed this. Go to an Asian restaurant. If they can't make good egg fried rice, to some extent, if you go to an Asian restaurant and they don't cook white rice well, there's no point eating there. If you go to an Asian restaurant and they cannot cook you good white rice, just white rice in a bowl and it tastes nice, cooked to a decent temperature it be not so super clumpy not so super chewy i guarantee you the rest of the menu is going to blow up but in this particular caribbean restaurant i went to not only was the rice and peas horrendous the curry goat was downright ab- an abomination most of the fucking goat had no meat on it all fat cool whatever the sauce the stew tasted of nothing i had plantain on the side nothing in it as well tasted coleslaw allegedly homemade in in house obviously not taken from a packet outside a fucking lid or something the only thing that was good and this is usually a sign that a restaurant is shit when their main dish that they should be known for isn't the strongest one 
Like I used to go to this restaurant in London called Chicken Sours. This restaurant called Chicken Sours in London was known for doing fried chicken. But the best thing on their menu was fried aubergines. They had these fried aubergine slices, things that they made. Delightful. But the actual fried chicken was garbage. That's not good. When your when your shop is called Chick and Sours, the main thing is chicken. Chick. If you can't do that right, you're fucked. This Caribbean restaurant I went to, the best thing I got from that fucking list of stuff that I ordered was a patty. The the Jamaican patty that I got that was chicken, that was really nice. Nice flaky patty pastry. The chicken inside was a bit spicy. Like, really nice, actually. Even room temperature. It was quite good. But the rest of it was terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. And it made me realise again why I don't buy... Never, 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 never buy, never, never buy Jamaican food or any type of Caribbean food outside of carnival. Because not any old carnival is the greatest time to buy any Caribbean food. Because all the best Caribbean restaurants within London and surrounding counties come to Notting Hill Carnival to show off their wares. And if you're cheeky and you're clever, what you'll do is that on the first and second day, on the end, towards the end of the day, maybe around 4 p.m., maybe around 3 p.m., when everyone's already drunk and high and eaten loads and the stores have already got leftover food, you go to all the stores in Notting Hill Carnival and you ask them to give you whatever's left in a box. I've left Notting Hill Carnival at times with a bag full of fucking Caribbean food. They just put whatever was left over in the fucking plaque because they're not going to obviously use it for the next day. And I've just taken some of the best rice and peas, the best jerk, the best plantain all in a box. That's the best time to go to to go to fucking on your carnival. I'm actually considering. I'm actually considering because I don't usually ever do this. I don't ever usually go to kids day the first day, but I actually might go to kids day just so I can get the jerk. And then obviously go to the second day for the rave and for the fucking, you know, jumping up and down and drinking magnums with all my fellow niggas. But honestly, the only time I'm ever going to eat Jamaican food is not in your carnival because going to random Jamaican restaurants in London is such a flip of a coin. And the weird thing about this was this Jamaican restaurant I went to was not only across the road from the barbershop I was at, it was also full of fellow blacks who were enjoying and woofing down this food. So they made me think it was it was live, it was vibe, it was sick. But to be fair too, going back to that Louis C.K. joke, remember there was a Louis C.K. joke about, oh, if you go to the Italian restaurant and three big black women come out from the back, you're going to be like, when I was in there and I went in there, I saw some woman that, you know, let's say her surname could be Singh. And I was like, oh, she was serving me, she was lovely, but I was like, oh. Don't get me wrong, the, the owner was a black dude, but I saw some lady whose name could be Daljit come out and I was like, oh, I don't know if Daljit knows what I'm going with about red peas. Don't get me wrong, Daljit can cook a mean curry, but can she cook a mean curry goat? Could she cook a mean rice and peas? Obviously not. And again, I shouldn't be that type of guy. I shouldn't judge based on appearances, I know. But a part of my heart did sink to the floor when I handed over my 20 pounds and I saw Daljit come out of the kitchen. I was like, I think I might have made a mistake here. I think I might have made a mistake and I paid the big price. But, you know, when it comes to food, it is what it is. Sometimes you flip up a coin, right? You land on tails and you flip and fuck up. So it kind of is what it is. But what a nice reminder for me anyway. Never, ever, ever go to a Caribbean restaurant that number one, you haven't been recommended to. And number two, don't go to anyone outside of flipping carnival. It's no point. It's no point. Carnival is one of the best times ever to eat flipping Caribbean food. Why would I waste that? Why would I risk that just to try and try something out? Like, there's no point. It doesn't make any sense. So happy that I've learned my lesson. Bit annoyed I had to spend twenty pounds to learn the lesson. But sometimes you got to spend some money to figure out that you're an idiot. And I figured out quite quickly that I was a barnstorming idiota. E D O D A. And it's okay. And it's okay moving on moving on and moving on we have to say unfortunately unfortunately a huge and really somber sorry and r.i.p to the one and only upscale crack i didn't really know much about this guy to be completely honest i'm not really too plugged in to the sneaker reselling game i don't really know who's who or what's what but judging by the outpouring of love and appreciation and acknowledgement for this dude on social i'm guessing he was a good guy i'm guessing he was somebody that a lot of people rated because a lot of people in the sneaker scene don't really like sneakerheads myself included so the fact that he was getting so much love from randoms online is crazy um and obviously goes to show that he was a good dude but it is 
is really really sad to see this this is no way for anyone to pass and it's just an un unfortunate situation all in all so this is courtesy of complex sneakers it says rest in peace to upscale crack um born javier rosario Mejia, a reseller who was a mainstay at the sneaker releases in new york city for years if there was a lineup happening crack was there according to local news reports he was a victim of a robbery turned fatal in soho in the early hours of tuesday morning so there is that guy there upscale crack r.i.p to him born may 21st 1993 and died unfortunately june 25th 2024 now according to the report according to the report courtesy of the website what is it called courtesy of the website nbc new york he, nothing was even stolen from him so he's obviously one of these you know sneaker release, uh, resellers sorry that's very well known on social he's very maybe flashy he has a lot of jewelry on and shit you know talks his talk stunts and shit and lives his good life but allegedly nothing was even stolen from his person no one took anything from him that's the actual wild thing about this whole thing mate no one actually took anything from him and unfortunately he still ended up losing his life to absolutely tragic circumstances this is courtesy of nbc new york it says 31 year old popular sneaker reseller shot dead shot dead in soho it says a 31 year old man was shot to death in soho by a group who him in a robbery attempt early tuesday according to lisa a law enforcement source with direct knowledge of the investigation the man may have been attacked queens when he was attacked around 5 15 a.m on green street near grand street it supports sources say police have identified the victim as javier ozaria major of um, bayoun new jersey i'm guessing um ozaria major was a popular and established high-end sneaker seller known as upscale crack that's him there as you can see all right peter upscale crack the suspects fled in a black car according to our nbc news sources Ozaria major was found in the street and was rushed to new york city hospital but was not able to be saved um it continues here um chopper four showed a still active scene after the shooting with yellow caution tape calling off the cobblestone street um evidence markers were bu with bulletproof casings had been seen on both sides of the street and placed near the white suv with the new jersey plates its connection to the shooting unclear a pair of green tennis shoes were left behind on the sidewalk again i didn't know much about the dude but judging by the response on people on social and i guess that's the only way people want that's the only way you'd want to be remembered anyway right you'd want people that actually know you to talk about you in glowing terms once you pass and i've only heard great things about this dude online people are really showing loads of support for him the the kind of the tribute they had for him on the side of the street when he passed was really touching too i think they had loads of bottles of tequila his favorite one that he absolutely drank drank there loads of messages and cars so he was clearly a mainstay and a popular again this is a sneakerhead community people don't like anybody everyone's kind of jealous of everyone so the fact that everyone was outpouring of love of him and kind of giving him his props is proof that he was a really good guy and it's really unfortunate that he passed in this way so r.i.p upscale crackman he definitely deserved to go out that way and thoughts and feelings go out to his family and friends i can't imagine what they're going through right now seeing one of your close friends being slain like that on the side of the streets but you know it's just it, I, I don't know what can you say really everybody's out here struggling everybody's out here hungry and people are doing some crazy things maybe the fact that the you know the prison sentences for people that commit robberies isn't as high as it probably should be is contributing to the issue maybe it's the fact that nike are purposely you know creating this fake artificial flipping you know um, scarcity in the market that's driving people to think that sneakerheads have way more money than they think they have i don't know either way that guy didn't deserve to lose his life not in that particular way and r.i.p to upscale crack r.i.p to upscale crack i've been fascinated i've been fascinated i've been fascinated fascinated with the disappearance of jay slater the search is over there's no longer any sign of police in this rugged beautiful but treacherous part of tenerife it had been the focus of the hunt for missing British teenager Jay Slater. He travelled up to this Airbnb here in the remote northwest of the island with two British men after a night out. His phone signal was last located in this area. But a police request for volunteers to join a large search on Saturday only attracted small numbers. With the vast area yielding no clues, the civil guard has now called off the search. It means two weeks after Jay left this nightclub in southern Tenerife, we're still no closer to knowing what's happened to him.
This is a part of the island that's really popular with young British tourists. And speaking to people, you get a sense they have been more concerned about their safety since Jay Slater's disappearance. And they're now confused about why the search has been called off. George and Alex from Yorkshire are both 19, the same age as Jay. Well, it just makes me feel more cautious about situations and just try and stay as a group. It's always been on, on your mind, just, to, just in case something happened. The police have now called off the search up in the mountains. What do you think about that? A bit early. Right? Just, yeah, I thought... A bit, a bit of a surprise. I've been here nearly a week now. I've not seen any posters. Hardly seen any police patrol going around. Just, it's like not what's happened, really, so... Does just, that surprise yeah, you? Yeah. In the bars and restaurants along the strip, the news was filtering through. It's, it's interesting because it's only, what, two weeks ago we went missing? Uh, so I think it's a little bit early to call off the search, but obviously they know something that we don't. It's a bit um, disappointing in a way because he was a young boy like a, had that has a family and to know that he's still out there somewhere is quite, it is quite terrifying. Jay's mother and family who are out here in Tenerife can now only wait to see what police plan to do next. The search has ended, but the question remains, where is Jay Slater? Becky Johnson, Sky News, Tenerife. I was listening a bit to Tim Dillon as well, and I was like, Tim Dillon was mentioning some other kid in America who also disappeared that everybody's kind of looking for. But this kid is a bit more good looking. It's a bit more of a, you know, salacious story, but it's maybe tied to the whole true crime thing. And he was making a good point of saying that when your lives are boring, when there's nothing really going on in the real world, when people go missing, it is quite an entertaining thing to kind of get into and to try to kind of find out what's actually going on and trying to uncover, especially when there's loads of conspiracy theories around it. And in this particular Jay Slater case, it's really nuanced because by all intents and purposes, this Jay Slater kid, according to the articles I read online anyway, he wasn't the bestest of guys, right? He's not like an angel, right? He was involved in some crazy attack on some kid where they attacked him with a machete, split his head open, his whole brain was exposed and shit, and him and his friends all got off, right? They didn't spend a day in flipping jail. Now, that, that could be because they're all underage. It could be because they're all Caucasian. Who bloody knows? Either way, this kid is a bit of a wrong one, allegedly, right? Right. So there wasn't a lot of sympathy for him out there on the Internet, just on what he had done previously. Now he goes missing and there's stories around his missing, why he's missing. And this allegedly people are saying it's tied to some drug thing. Allegedly, he was selling drugs out there. Um, maybe he had run off on a plug. Maybe he didn't give back the money. Maybe in, in true British English fashion, he got a advance on some of the gear and just sniffed it all up his nose. Because if you know anything about British people, if you know anything about English folk, especially white people, when they start dealing drugs, there's a real high tendency for most of them to turn into users. I've seen, especially in my days of going out and scoring some of these class A drugs myself it's usually only foreigners Albanians black people Asians sometimes who can sell drugs and not do them whenever I've seen an English dealer they always look like a nitty they always look like a bit of a crackhead they always look like they do a bit too much of their gear and they're not just purely in it for the business thing right they're in it to maybe you know shag some birds who want some fucking free gear just live the life of a dealer you know whatever it may be but they do probably indulge a little bit too much like I've not I don't think I've met a single lad who sells drugs who, who, who isn't also a bit of a party boy I don't think I've met a single one. Whereas I've met like legit, I've met dealers, especially Asian guys who just do the gear and they program as a day job. Doesn't even touch it. Completely stone cold sober. All he does is drink fucking Red Bull, but he's selling you fucking, you know, shards of fucking MDMA. Do you know what I mean? So those guys definitely exist. But for some reason, my lads out there, I don't know, man, my lads indulge too much. So people are assuming or, you know, speculating, as we say, that he might have done that. Now, it could also be a very tragic situation where this guy gets abducted by people and something really bad happened to him, right? Who knows? I'm going to say something very controversial here. I personally think most likely this is another evidence to me, especially us British folk, and our inability to handle our drugs and our drinks. And I'm speaking for myself, to myself, and for everybody else. We are so crap at partying we are so crap at raging we are so crap at getting on it we are so crap at do, having fun 
that's why we have so many rules in this country that's why so many things are banned that's why we we are terrible tourists that's why that we're banned from parts of amsterdam that's why people in spain don't like us that's why when we go to berlin they turn us away at flipping clubs and shit we are horrible whenever we go to countries that have more looser relaxed regulations around drinking and doing drugs we go nuts we cannot handle ourselves and i think in this particular situation if the drug store drug dealing stories are not true if the whole machete attack on that boy was a one-off incident and this kid's an angel most likely this is an instance of this guy doing too much going loopy going on a wonder getting lost and ending up in trouble but the fundamental point is that not being able to handle your drugs and i think this is a conversation that needs to be had aloud like what is it about us english people we can't handle our booze and we can't handle our drugs. We're just incapable of doing so. You go to a Weatherspoons in a very popular part of London, and you go there sometimes at 11 p.m., especially in a dodgy part of London, uh, outside of Weatherspoons, not even a proper nightclub, a Weatherspoons, a chain fucking pub, and you will see scores of people outside just absolutely looking like demons, unable to stand up, unable to talk, being just rowdy, antisocial behavior, pissing up against walls, shoving their fingers down some girl's throat, like just trying to steal glasses on their jackets, trying to steal plates of chips, like just a mess. We are a mess. Doesn't matter what race it is. As long as we've got that burgundy fucking British passport, anybody here in London, you know it. Whether it's not in your carnival, whether it's watching England, we are diabolical when it comes to enjoying ourselves. We just can't handle it. Now put us in a hot, sunny climate. Take us to fucking Tenerife, surrounded by our friends. Take us to Magaluf. Take us to Ibiza, right? Take us to Madrid, Barcelona, with some friends, with some cervezas, huh? With some pinchos. Imagine how crazy we're gonna get, especially in a place where maybe the quality of gear that's coming through is a bit more pure than what we get in England, right? There's, these are all coastal countries some of the stuff is coming there directly from colombia right some of the stuff is coming directly from morocco and shit cool it's a bit strong maybe it's coming inland from amsterdam and shit but we can't handle ourselves and this is why we end up in so much trouble and this is why there's so many rules around what we do so many rules around what we should do and shouldn't do it's really tragic and i wish there was a better way to handle it i really do wish because i think if us British folk could handle our gear and our drugs properly, or our drugs and our drink, or our gear and our drink, whatever way you want to say it, our D&D, &D, maybe the government will be a little bit more lax and a little bit more relaxed in terms of the regulations about what you can and cannot do. But I think the government knows. They know if they really were to let the, you know, let the restrictions go down. Like, imagine if they made, spare me for one, spare me for a second here. Entertain this thought. Imagine if the British government, imagine if the British government legalize cannabis just cannabis nothing crazy just cannabis imagine if the british government if the british government decided to legalize cannabis we would be one of the only countries in the world where we'd have people od on cannabis we might be one of the only countries in the world where we have actual accounts of people ODing and dying because of doing too much cannabis we have no ability we have no ability to do anything in moderation zero ability to do anything in moderation we are a mess we are a mess anyway talking about this story here is a story courtesy of sky news is update on jay slater it says a british tiktok user dismisses the final police search for a missing teenager as a massive pr thing so some do-gooder right some fucking teacher's pet some dork some guy that's not even related to this guy's disappearance or family decided to go out to Tenerife himself and go and try and find this kid, right? Obviously, it's a bit self-serving. He's not doing it from the kind of his heart. He knows that if he does it and he does find this guy, he's going to be getting interviewed, you know, from flipping BBC, CTTV, whatever, all day fucking long. So it's obviously a way for him to kind of boost his profile. But it is a bit dorky to kind of leave your humble abode to go look for a teenager that clearly just did too much care and got lost in a mountain. You know, shit happens. But anyway, let's read the story. A volunteer who flew out to Tenerife to help try to find missing Jay Slater has dismissed the final police search that the British teenager as a massive PR thing. Paul Arnott, who's been sharing clips of his search on TikTok, told Sky News last week that he flew out to Tenerife when he heard a 19-year-old family needed help. What a 
dork. What an absolute dork, bro. Don't you have a job? Don't you have a family to look after? You go in there to go help a... F- like, what? How about how about if he gets uncovered that this family's scamming and this whole thing's a fucking ruse and the kid's somewhere in some person's Airbnb chilling and just not touching his fucking phone? Come on, man. What is all this shit? Mr. Slater has seen... Um, on Monday the 17th of June after he told friend he planned to walk the northern west village of Masca a holiday combination of Los, Cris- Los Cristianos in the south a journey that would have taken 11 hours on foot let's be real he was last seen on Monday the 17th of June I'm talking to you now and it's now currently Tuesday the 2nd of July if this kid isn't D-E-A-D most likely he's somewhere hiding but the chances of finding him alive are pretty slim you know it is what it is Police on the island confirmed on Sunday that the search for Mr. Slater had been called off nearly two weeks after his disappearance. It came a day after the police urged volunteers to come forward to help the large-scale search in the Masca area. Recording a TikTok video from the site on Saturday, Mr. Arnott said, So guys, I've literally been waiting for absolutely ages now. This is a massive PR thing, I'm telling you. There's people everywhere, literally people everywhere. Nobody's doing anything. Why would they? Why would they? It must be hell. It must be hell to be a Tenerife bar owner, to be a Tenerife breakfast spot owner, cafe owner, laundry owner, Airbnb owner, holiday resort owner, hotel owner, whatever. Because in one respect, the British people, the English folk that come to your tiny island to come and party during the summers, as some of the Europeans... They basically fund your entire life. They allow your kids to go to school. They fucking pay for your second car. They allow you to make an extension on your home. They basically are the reason why you guys are living a good life. But on the other side of it, you must hate when they come around because they leave your places a pigsty. They come to your bars. They drink too much. They fight. They vomit everywhere. And in some cases, they do too much drugs and they get lost in the mountains, take up all your police resources looking for them right and then they also give your island a bad name because it makes it look like people are not being regulated and kind of looked after the right way when it's no it's not the case it's just english people not being able to you know kind of judge things and do things with imbalance so you must hate the tourism tourism must be such a love-hate relationship with people in these type of places what do you do you can't live without these people because they literally legitimately legitimately fund your life support you keep your family's lights on and shit allow your kid to go to foreign school to go to a fucking university somewhere abroad but on the other side they legitimately can be seen vomiting out of the second floor window of your airbnb and leaving a string a trail of fucking vomit like a snail running down the side of your building that you still haven't able to wash off since last year (sighs) he added I've been here for ages. Yeah, there's people everywhere. Everyone's still in their cars. I'm going to crack on with the search for Jay in the area where I think he is. I've, I've, it's been so quiet about this. I'm not doing any more, people. I'm sick of this crap. And there's the guy there, right? He definitely looks like a guy that would legitimately leave his own home to go search for somebody he doesn't know in another country. Absolute dork. Um, continuing on. In a follow-up video, he says, it's so, I'm so blooming stressed and annoyed about what's just happened. I thought today was going to be so productive. I thought so many people were going to show up. I thought it was going to be really organised. I thought it was going to be really massive and it's not. Bro, one thing I've learned in my short time on this earth never get involved in other people's shit offer your condolences from afar but never get involved you never know what's going on unless you're direct family why are you getting involved in this way why are you making it all about yourself why are you documenting this stuff on fucking tiktok in the first place that's the first mistake you made getting involved in other people's business and now you're surprised good luck a group of around 30 to 40 volunteers turned up to help rescue teams on Saturday, scouring the huge area of rugged and hilly terrain. It came after Mr. Slater's mother, Debbie Duncan, his father, Warren, and brother, Zach, flew out to help police at Mountain Rescue, ter- uh, rescue Team search for the teenager shortly after he first disappeared. There he is there with his mum. Miss du- Miss Duncan told the Telegraph that she ha- that she has every faith in the police that been trying to find her son. She also said she couldn't thank Paul Arnold enough for his efforts. Police said that they are keeping the investigation to Mr. Slater's disappearance open after they ended their search efforts on Sunday. However, they added they could yet they could yet open up searches in the south of the island, but have not provided any updates. 
A British man who travelled to the island after Slater have disappeared said, I was a little bit more scared about coming here than I have been and me and my friend have made sure that we each have each other's location, which we wouldn't have done before all this happened. Bro, you don't need to share your location with your best friend. You know what you need to do? You need to take that pill, you need to break it into four little bits. You need to take the MDMA and crush it as fine as you can and dab it a little bit with your fucking finger. You need to do a line and maybe wait between lines, half an hour, an hour. That's what you need to do. Just moderate yourself. If you're drinking booze in a very sunny climate and you're getting dehydrated, guess what you do? You drink some water in between every fucking pint, in between every fucking cocktail. It's not that difficult. And maybe, you know what, if you're getting too fucked up, you know what you do? You know what you do if you get too fucked up instead of sharing your location with all your fucking contacts and making them responsible for your fucking well-being. You know what you do when you're getting too fucked up. You just stop. I know it's impossible for us British people to surmise and to rationalise, but if you're getting so fucked up that you need to share your location with your entire contact list and make them responsible for you getting home like you're fucking 10, stop drinking and stop doing drugs. Maybe it's just not for you, which is perfectly okay too. Nothing has to be for everybody. Maybe doing drugs and drinking isn't for you if you have to have people legitimately check up on you and make sure you got home okay. Because as a grown-ass adult, that doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. But again, what do I know? A British woman on holiday on the island said it was disappointing that police had ended their search and added, he's a young boy. There's a family to know that he's out there somewhere. It's quite terrifying. Really, is it though? Is it though? If he didn't go off wandering by himself, trying to find Wi-Fi or trying to score another baggy, would he be? Would he? Would he still be alive now? Probably, probably. If he didn't do that last bit of fucking care in the bathroom and end up in a fucking KO and end up in some mountain somewhere and mistook a ridge and mistook a K for his double bed, right in some Airbnb, would he still be alive right now? Probably. Another man from the UK who's holidaying in Tenerife said. I've been here for a week. I've seen no posters. Hardly any police patrols are going around. It's like nothing's happened, really. Why would Tenerife completely stop what they're doing? As a f fucking... And just decide to put all their resources in finding a teenager who most likely just did too much and didn't know how to self-relegate. So have to self-regulate and shit. Why should it be their responsibility? Why? 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 Mrs. Slater had been holidaying with friends in the southern Tenerife before traveling to the northern um, western village of Masca with two people he met on the NRG Music Festival on Sunday, 16th of June. After the event ended, he got into the car and traveled to a small Airbnb in Masca with two men who police said on Saturday were not relevant to the case. So the two men that dropped him off to see, this is the thing, see, look what's happened here. Look what's happened here. They tried to make it seem like the two men in the car were the suspects, but I guess the, the two men in the car have been ruled out the investigation. This kid leaves the MBB without his friends, by the way. Leaves the festival without his friends. He gets into the car with two people he doesn't know. Most likely they're dealers. Most likely they are just random people he bumped. Because sometimes when you go to a foreign country and you're a British person, you get drunk somewhere, you get fucked up, and some random people end up taking you to your location, to your fucking accommodation. It's happened to me in the past. I'm not talking for it from a point of fucking superiority. I'm British like everybody else. I've done some fuck shit. Sometimes you end up in a car with strangers and they drop you off at your hotel because they know most likely you're staying here. Cool, it's happened before. They dropped him off. So these people are saying, no, we dropped him off at the, at, the, at, the, at the front of this hotel. There's probably CCTV footage that can corroborate their story. They see them dropping him off. They see him wandering into the fucking hotel, kind of. And then from there, he disappeared. So they did their job. They got strangers who aren't even his friends got him back home. And somehow he still ends up getting lost in the mountains. <laughs> Absolutely insane. Mr. Slater from Oswald Oswald Thistle near Blackburn in Lancashire told a friend over the phone in 8.30 a.m. in the following morning that he was walking back to his holiday accommodation after missing a bus. So maybe he was taken to a location to get a bus before getting to the Airbnb. The police corroborated that CCTV footage I could see, hey, he got left at this bus stop to get a bus to go to the Airbnb. He was given direct instructions, get on this number bus and it'll take you back to your fucking Airbnb. He didn't take that bus. He maybe slept at the bus stop, whatever. They decided walking and then got lost. You know, it's kind of his fault, man. He also said he was lost in need of water and only had 1% charge of his... <laughs> 
<laughs> That's one of the most fatal mistakes you ever make, right? One percent charge and you call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know that one percent charge is gone if i'd rather you know what i'd rather do i'd rather get my google maps up and find my airbnb on the map and then at least have an idea in my brain that i'm going in the right direction apart from finding a friend personally but most likely like most fucking useless people he didn't know where his airbnb was most likely one person in that group knew who knew the address of the airbnb was responsible for the key and that sort of shit. You know, I don't know. Some people are just weird when they go holiday with friends. Instead of taking responsibility and having some idea where the where the Airbnb is, where the hotel was, and I don't know, whatever, they put all the responsibility in the other person. They didn't let them have the key. Have your own key. Know where the address is. So at least when if you want to go home by yourself, which I don't advise by the way, I think there should be a rule. If you go to a foreign country for a festival with your friends, you should all go together and leave together. I don't know about you. Again, I'm not the most scaredy cat guy in the world, but I think if you go to a foreign country with your fucking friends to a music festival, the least you can do is go there together and leave together. Especially if your group is mixed sex. Like, are you just gonna leave your girlfriend to be at the by herself, or you let her leave alone? Or you, like, it doesn't make any sense. So that would eliminate a lot of the issues because at least in a group, even if it's just two or three, one person's at least gonna be a bit more like you know sober to get you all home at the same time. But again, that's also going back to the idea of like, why do you need a why do you need to, why do you need like assistance as an adult to get home at an hol after an holiday? Come on, bro grown-ups need, needed a handheld to go home the last person to see mr slater was matt was a masca resident called olafelia medina hernandez who spoke to a teenager on monday the 17th of june miss hernandez said she told him a bus was due at 10 a.m as he seemingly hoped to get back to his accommodation however he set off walk ah he did that thing that everybody does he thought he could just walk it home not realizing that he's in a rural part of the country where there's not much transportation around and things look a lot further than they look like on a map. Side walking, got exhausted, ended up somewhere and then he's probably turned into a scarecrow by now. Ah, he was told, but again, he calls his friend at eight, eight in the morning. The bus is going to come at 10. When you're fucked up and it's the morning and you're dehydrated and you just want your bed, eight to 10 a.m. seems like 24 hours. It doesn't, it's not really, it's only two hours, maybe less, but he probably, it probably just seemed too much time to wait. So he couldn't wait and just started walking, thinking Negan would like, you know, see the bus coming along the street. I don't know what he thought. Bad mistake. However, he self walking and she said later that he, she drove past him while he was walking fast. <laughs> By the way, isn't this hilarious how we are as human beings? This woman sees this guy at bus stop clearly pinging off his brain, probably still high, pro yeah, probably still drunk, probably looking very disheveled, very young boy. He's clearly lost. He asks her what time the bus is going to come. She says in her broken English, broken Spanish, wherever she does, she communicates to him, hey, senor, chico, hombre, stay here. The bus is coming at 10 a.m. The kid walks off, thinking he's going to find it himself. She gets into a car and drives past him and doesn't offer to pick him up. <laughs> doesn't tell him to get in the car. <laughs> no one gives a fuck about anybody. <laughs> she sees him walking. And she doesn't say, hey, jump in. Hey, lad, jump in, man. You're clearly fucked up. Jump in. She just walk, drives past. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. A GoFundMe appealed. A GoFundMe appealed to get Jay Slater home. It was set up by his friend Lucy Law and has already raised more than 43000 as the police search came to an end. So, yeah. Who knows? If it's a scam, it's a scam. Well done. Hope they, you know, enjoy the 43 grand they've made. If the kid is legitimately D-E-A-D, -E um, obviously it's sad and the 43,000 will come nowhere close to repairing that damage. But this should be a cautionary tale for all British folk out there, my English people out there, my fellow Brits, my fellow lads. Please use moderation when you're traveling. Please have a level of balance when you're going out raving, especially in a foreign country, especially in a place that's a bit warm, especially in a place that you're not too familiar with. You have to have some sort of balance, some sort of like, you know what I mean? You can't be going so crazy that you legitimately get lost in the, in the, in a legitimately one of the most scariest places I've seen. When you see videos and images of how densely wooded and you know rural and mountaineery and traily tenerife looks especially outside of the main strip 
it's easy to get lost there so bloody hell man you know thoughts and feelings go out to that kid's family hopefully they find him nice and safe it's not looking likely because you know he disappeared in june on was it june the 6th or something crazy whatever it was 17 16th we're now on the 2nd of july it's unlikely that he's going to be found alive but if he does get found alive uh, hopefully it's a lesson to all people to fucking please have balance some semblance of fucking balance when it comes to the boozing and going out and getting fucking crazy because jesus this isn't the way to go but again what do i know absolutely nothing absolutely nothing talking about exactly yo big up asada disease in the chat big up Zara's disease in the chat bro i'm not helping out some tweak on the side of the road you tripping exactly if big up yonder by exactly we might be on exactly <laughs> <laughs> point the tweak on their way home point them to the direction of where they need to go and carry on your way do you know what I mean you got yourself in this tweaky position it's not my responsibility to fucking sort you out I love that I love that big up all the responsible people in the chat um, Chris Mack decides to take 12 hour walk instead of waiting for 2 hours for the next bus SMH exactly <laughs> big up Chris Mack uh, exactly big up Z 1% he ain't calling a cab or the police exactly it's one percent honestly will be enough for you to get the location up on your phone on the maps so that you can kind of you know or orientate yourself and figure out okay which way do i need to go that way or this way you know kind of he shouldn't have called a friend that was a wrong decision to make but again i, I bet he's one of those type of people who when you go to a festival he starts asking that one friend who's playing next bro don't you have the lineup the set list yourself you've come to the festival with me why are you asking me who's playing next but there's probably one person who's in charge of like all of that shit. Who's got the itinerary, who's doing all the logistics. It's like so annoying. I hate people that do that. We're just whatless. Do you know what I mean? They can't Google themselves. They can't Google things themselves. They're not, they don't have any form of self, self-reliance, self self-resilience. It's just horror show. People like that shouldn't go on holiday personally. But hey, what do I know? Um, big up Z, I wouldn't walk in a rodden forest on my own country. I ain't doing it overseas. Exactly. 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 But hey, let's see let's see let's see let's see let's see let's see yeah exactly eli windsor that's the thing that's fucked up about english people you you brits are known for getting fucked up on, on the liquor that's the thing about fucked up about us there's a lot of us that do drugs but for the majority of us people if you've been to a pub if you've been to a local pub in england you'll know that the way we get fucked up the most is with beer beer and alcohol in general alcohol is our achilles heel forget fucking drugs forget class a class b class c drugs our achilles heel as english slash british people is alcohol we just cannot handle it we have no sense of balance or whatever we have nothing we just go crazy it's just honestly it, it beggars belief sometimes it beggars belief how unable we are to kind of modulate ourselves it's crazy anybody that's been to like a european festival major ones you will know the brits are the worst and i speak as a fellow brit it's so embarrassing how unable we are to kind of regulate ourselves it's fucking crazy bro especially when we go to a festival in mainland europe and like they have cheaper drinks cheaper entry way more relaxed rules around bringing certain stuff in and suddenly we start going fucking nuts anyway talking about going nuts talking about being proud of being british some of you have probably seen this video on social courtesy of shadeborough a graphic video of a prison officer and inmate having sex in hmp wandsworth goes viral legitimately one of the most hottest things you've seen in your life and also one of the most scariest gruesome and downright diabolical things you've seen in your life both sides maybe one of the most hottest pieces of adult content you've seen but also somewhat downright deplorable <laughs> that this is happening in a flipping prison so if you're not aware this viral this video went viral on uk social media maybe it's not going viral on your side of it but on my side of things uk social media this video went viral that shows this guy these two guys in their prison cell right one guy's recording a video of his friend banging one of the screws in their fucking room and it's not like a old video it's a current video and he's in there smoking a joint number one right in his room in his cell sorry room in his cell and his friend has got the prison officer bent over with her fucking face facing the fucking door <laughs> smashing her from behind while he's covering her mouth so she doesn't make too much noise and people don't come and see anything a prison officer and then it gets discovered that this prison officer 
is some sort of OnlyFans girl. She's also in a polyamorous relationship and shit, but she's obviously a very attractive, kind of conventionally looking sex worker type of girl. And the first thing that I thought about when I saw the video, I was like, how come they employ people that look like her in a prison? Not to be like, you know, judgy and shit, but I didn't think they would employ clearly attractive, horny people in a prison. Maybe in like a correctional facility, but in an actual prison prison, I didn't think it made any sense to hire somebody that looks like that because more than likely, you know, shit's going to happen. <laughs> it's just crazy. Like, maybe you should hire some, you know, some hags, hire some absolute cows. That might be way more applicable to a prison. But hiring someone that looks like this in a place where people are doing life sentences, right, surrounded by other men, in a place where people are extremely if, any, if there is a place you know i think i don't know if, I, if this is fair to say but i'd imagine uk prisons are probably way more homophobic than us prisons by you know by comparisons so most likely a lot of those guys are just you know refusing to do anything it's not like they're going to the other side because they're in prison for so long so they're deprived and then you're li literally put in a plate of fucking meat in front of them fresh meat on a fucking platter what do you expect them to do but in this particular case i'm wondering this is another case of like the viral virus because what would possess you what would possess you as a prison inmate to upload this video on the internet if this is a situation that you have if you have some baddie you have some ig fought you have some of whore some slaw who's willing to risk her job and her freedom to bang you in a dingy prison cell with your fucking celly in the back smoking a joint, why would you share this on the internet? Why would you mess up such a good situation? You're probably in there for like, what? Let's say, the only reason why you do this anyway is because you're probably in there for a long time. I'd imagine if you're in there for a parking ticket, you're not going to bother trying to, you know, smash a fucking prison guard. But if you're doing more than five years, I get it, right? Boys' brains go crazy. You need some contact. You need to touch some cheeks, slap some cheeks, whatever. You do what needs to be done. But why would you mess up such a great opportunity? Because I'd imagine, more than likely, there isn't a lot of women that work in prisons that look like this lady. It's not likely, right? It's not likely. I would imagine to be the case. She's not probably the quintessential prison guard, right? You get the opportunity to be in a prison where, because again, Wandsworth as well, I'd, 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 just just to say as a throwing out something here, I'd imagine it's probably made up of a lot of like youngish guys, right? Under what, between like 25 and 45, you know, road dudes about it, gifted the gab, you know, they've got some bodies on them, girls like that, a bit of rough on them and shit. They might have acid attacked some old lady, you know, they've got some reps, they've got some straps on their shoulders and shit. So certain type of woman would be attracted to that shit why 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 would these guys mess up the situation it's all because of the viral virus they're most likely going to get in trouble themselves they're probably going to get time added to their sentence this woman's probably going to get fired or she's already been fired she's probably going to get some time in jail as well and you've baked up the entire thing the prison's probably going to impose new restrictions new security measures become more tight all because you wanted to go viral on social media yeah don't get me wrong it was viral yeah it was cool to see the video yeah it looked like some scene you might see in naughty america cool porn hub x videos thing fair enough they're probably gonna make parodies off of this but why would you mess up such a great opportunity for yourself why would you do that i just can't figure it out it's so fucking bizarre the girl involved is clearly loving it because there's a part of it where the guy clearly shows the camera and goes in front of her face and she's like moaning and groaning and shit the guy's covering her mouth and then i think people are freaking out honestly it was only in england look at the difference in england right of the responses guys online are freaking out that the dude was kissing this woman like, oh no you can't kiss her because she's a slag it's like bro surely the kiss should be the least of your worries that this guy is banging this woman raw dog in a prison so, <laughs> that should be maybe the most concerning thing no people are more concerned that this guy's kissing this girl it's like uh <laughs> what do you guys do then when you're having sex you just not kiss people honestly british lads man them are the oddest people i swear to god man them in the uk are the oddest people what do you do when you're smashing you just don't kiss 
what she has to be a virgin and then you have to and then you're allowed to kiss her because there are some guys in the uk who believe you shouldn't kiss girls in clubs that's fucking dumb right the amount of fucking foundation i've had on my face over the years bruh man put up michael jordan numbers back in the days right <laughs> that's the funnest part about going out on a night out right about kissing somebody that you think looks like lauren london then you get back home and that person looks like lizzo do you know what I mean that's the funnest thing that's the funnest part literally tonguing down some stranger somewhere and then having some boy on the side of your face that's the funnest part roll the dice man have some fun bruv man's out here kissing randoms saying i love you to randoms like rago rago this is what you do when you're outside bro if, are you outside or are you not outside if you're outside you kiss randoms and you say you love them not even just to secure the cheeks because you feel it not even just because you actually feel it at the moment i love you man I don't, w w hold on what's your name again yeah i love you fuck it <laughs> who hasn't said i love you to someone they don't know who hasn't said I love you to someone they don't know just because they felt it in a moment? I know I have. Huh? I know I have. Man didn't want to be out there and pretend like, oh, no, I'm, I'm a gangster. I only kiss girls that I'm going to wife. I only kiss baddies. bro. I've lips down ones. I've said I love you to zeros. It is what it is. It's all numbers on the fucking board. And if it was me and I was in prison and I was doing a fucking bird, right? And I was doing... I was on fucking IPP or whatever that shit is. I was, I was on a proper M charge, 30 plus years. And I had some prison guard, some Lithuanian, Portuguese, wherever this woman is from, right? Some Polish, wherever this woman's from. You know, those girls, they love bad boys, right? If I was in there, she liked me because I was a bad boy, right? And I was getting to smash this woman behind the fucking prison door in front of my fucking towel that was covering the little hole there, right? And she was in there and I'm smashing this on her fucking makeup and lipstick is, and her fucking Joe Malone lipstick is covering is all over my fucking fingers as I'm trying to close her mouth and make sure she doesn't moan too much. If I'm in that situation, I'm not recording it and uploading it on the internet. It's absolutely insane. Even recording it on your own phone is really, really dumb. Because if you your phone your room gets searched and they look through your fucking um phone and see all the shit you got on it, you're gonna get in trouble still. Just keep that in your brain, man. Why don't niggas have fucking memory banks in here? Why don't people have fucking, you know, brain lacy, right? Have a, have a lacy drive in your fucking brain and just store what's happening in your fucking brain and then replay that back later. Make your brain a fucking memory stick. You don't have to fucking record everything like a fucking loser. Honestly, I'm, I'm just shocked by this. Number one, that it's happening. I didn't know they hired baddies in fucking jails. And number two, I'm shocked that this guy would fuck up such a great thing. And also, number three, people complaining that he kissed her. I'm like, bruh, wouldn't you kiss her if you saw her in, down the street? Wouldn't you kiss this girl? <laughs> Why wouldn't you? You're already doing 35 years anyway. <laughs> You're already doing 35 years. Fuck it. <laughs> You're doing 35 years. Fuck it, man. Kiss her. <laughs> Get t whole tongue in all sorts, bruv. Saliva, we're exchanging. Anyway, there's an update on this. There's an update. Of course. One's a female prison officer. Ex-officer, but she got fired. Appears in court, accused of having sex with an inmate in X-rated film after arrest at Heathrow. So she was trying to leave the country, bruh. This woman was trying to leave the country. <laughs> she was trying to leave the country. What are you doing, bro? Stay at home. Put a little cheeky wink emoji on your social media. Put your OF fucking link in your bio. Her OF would be going crazy. If she just stayed at home and just lent into it and was like, oopsie, and did like that. Or maybe did the kind of the monkey eye emoji thing, eye covering with a little eye popping out or the eyes to the side. Come on, bro, man. You would have made so much money. Maintain composure. Don't run away. You're not going to get out of the country. Come on, bro. Come on, man. Anyway, let's read the article courtesy of the Daily Mail. The female prison officer accused of being accused of being filmed, accused, you know, that's her, man. We know that's her, was arrested by police at Heathrow Airport today. The Metropolitan Police launched an urgent probe on Friday after officers were made aware of a video said to have been filmed inside HMP Wandsworth. Linda de Souza Abreu, oh, Portuguese lady, isn't it? God damn. You know she was throwing that shit back like she was in fucking Nando's. You know, innit? 
you know she was throwing that shit back like she was in fucking Nando's like wow well, go on eh? cool so Linda de Souza Brew 30 who works as a guard at the prison was apprehended in Heathrow on Saturday before a flight to see relatives in Madrid yeah right yeah fucking right relatives relatives she was attempted to travel on a Portuguese passport <laughs> she thought she was clever she thought she could leave the country under her Portuguese passport Oh yeah, they won't know me because they know me as like Lady L, right, on the streets. But actually, my name is Linda. <laughs> Mr. Souza appeared at Oxbridge Magistrates Court in West London today, charged with misconduct in public office by engaging in sexual. That's that's actually a charge, you know. There's actually a charge that exists that is called engaging in sexual act with a prisoner in a prison cell. God damn, bro! And that's her. Come on, bro. Come on, man. I've lips worse in Dawson. I've lips worse in Hackney. I've lips worse in Peckham, New Cross, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool. I've lips far worse, far worse. People that you'd look at, you think, oh my God, Agostino, oh my God. People that you'd literally see and you'd scream if you saw them. You'd scream, oh my God, Agostino, no. You'd scream, I've lips. I'd be tonguing this down like, ah. Do you know what I mean? I'll be spelling my name on her face, bro. Uh, A-G. Uh, yeah. I'll be spelling her name on my fuck with my fucking tongue. <laughs> That's her in the court. Nice illustration of her. Right. Even look, she even looks bad in illustration. She's even a baddie in the fucking illustration. Somebody drew a picture of her using fucking pastel with using chalk fucking pastels. Right? Somebody drew a picture of her and she still looks like a baddie. Come on, bro come on man come on wearing a custody issued grey tracksuit she spoke only to confirm her name date of birth and address prosecuting Niam Niam Madonahu told the court Mr. Souza was apprehended at Heathrow airport where a flight had been booked for Madrid I believe that she was had relatives living there a Portuguese passport was seized by police when she was apprehended. She's Portuguese national with a Portuguese passport. Defending Garati, was that Gariardi? Look at that name, Gayati. You know, of course, Gayati is defending her. Gayati Yoga Yo Yogaraja. Gayati Yogaraja said that Mr. Souza had notified HMP ones of telling them of her trans travel duly passed on Scotland Yard. The 30 year old was granted conditional bail and will appear in the plea, the case and hearing on July 29th. Yo, God damn. She must remain at the Southwest London address given to the court. Her, pu her Portuguese passport must remain with the police and she cannot make any attempt to retrieve it. She is forbidden from applying or being in possession of international travel documents and she is handed over her Portuguese identity card. Mrs. Souza is also forbidden to enter any UK port or be, it must be electronic. Oh, she's got a tag. She's also got tagged. Yo, that, that sex is not worth it, innit? Her record is probably done forever. Her judge prospects are all but finished. But her OF should go up. Her OF should go up. Her OF should go up. Her job prospects are all but fucked, but her OF should go up. The only issue that she has, maybe she's not like, because that's the thing. Every guy assumes all girls that do OF are slags, but that's not the case. Some people just do OF because why the fuck not? So if she's not a slag and she's not that confident in like pursuing that adult entertainment sex work stuff, She's going to be kind of fucked, isn't it? Because she can't get a regular job anymore. That's the only issue. But if she doesn't mind changing her entire persona and really leaning into this OF thing and just forgetting being an employed person and just riding that train until the wheels fall off, she should be fine because this exposure should help her. But if she wants to be a normal, regular, regular civilian, that, that life is over. A prison service spokesman said staff corruption is not tolerated and former prison officers allegedly f featured in the video has been reported to the police. It would be inappropriate to comment further while they investigate. Bruh. What happened to the, what happened to the, 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 the other guys that actually banged at them? What happened to them? Are they in trouble? And I also wonder, I also wonder, I'm also wondering, how gay is it? How gay is it? to be in a prison cell with your Cody, with your guy, and be filming him banging a prison guard. How gay is it? Because a lot of those guys in there are incredibly homophobic, 
incredibly homophobic like even wearing pink for some some of those dudes in prison is like you know scary and it's almost like you're, you've literally sucked a dick if you wear pink or you don't wear no socks with your fucking loafers but how gay is it how gay is it to be in a prison cell with your boy and as he's smashing you like guide his piece in and shit you hold his piece and you guide it in yeah bro go on go on go on you zoom in you go underneath and you start zooming in like that how gay is that you start zooming into his face as he's moaning and groaning you start zooming into his butt like how how gay is that actually is that more gay than actually gay sex or is that gayer i'll go as far as saying it's actually gayer <laughs> <laughs> I'd go as far as saying it's actually gayer to film your boy smashing somebody in the prison cell, having all that his sex must in the air, you enjoying it, maybe you getting off on it as well, cucking yourself in the corner, waiting for your turn. I think that's way gayer than actually gay sex. No one can disagree with me on that one. I don't care what anyone says. That's actually way fucking gayer. There's actually a weird update here where she's coming out of the prison covering her face. She looks like she's smiling. If I scroll up on the shade, bro, there's a post of her where she's leaving the prison and she looks like she's smiling um, as she's leaving. I don't know why she's covering her face because, you know, girl, let people see who you are. Put the OF URL on your, on your fucking hoodie or something. Like, come on, man. Push, 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 push. This is your only time to fucking enjoy this moment. Like, push. She's out here covering her face. Why are you covering your face, babes? Let the people see who you are, in it. Uh, fuck it. There she is. Disgraced former police officer Linda De Souza Abru leaves court with new bail conditions, and there she is hiding her face. I don't know why she's hiding her face, man. Let people see who you are, babes. You get me? Fuck them. Obviously, there's them confirming it here in fucking court, and we see the obviously the video. God damn. But like I said, one of the most aggressively hot videos you've seen in your life but also wow the prison system is all messed up in it imagine hiring of girls to be prison guards and then being surprised when they do of things imagine imagine hiring an of girl giving her a job in a male only prison with guys who are doing serious time no contact with the outside world and expecting them to not get up to any sorts of madness and then being shocked like there must be a real lack in prison guards in the moment it must be such a hard it must be such a hard place to employ people you know people just don't want to work in those type of conditions the hours they do blah 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 but i don't know man i don't know i don't know imagine walking in on your first day and you're in prison and you see her as your prison guard she's coming she's coming to tell you to fucking you know lights out aggie lights out <laughs> aggie lights out <laughs> Aggie lights out. <laughs> Imagine you're in prison. Just her voice. <laughs> just her voice might make you want, might make you bust. Just her voice through the door, banging her baton on the fucking door might make you bust. Just her voice. Lights out. Aggie lights out. <laughs> She's in there with red lipstick and shit. You're just like, you, you haven't seen, your own girlfriend has abandoned you. Your parents haven't seen you. Your relatives are disappointed in you. And she's like, lights out. <sighs> Bro, I'm ready to buzz already. Buzz. But yeah, free Linda, man. Free Linda. She did nothing wrong. Free Linda. She did absolutely nothing wrong. The boys that recorded her are idiots. They fucked up a good situation. The prison that hired her are dumb. She's an OF girl doing OF things. What do you expect? Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know why she just doesn't. She needs to lean into the OF thing. I'm assuming she'll be fine anyway. She'll do the circuit of the UK podcast and shit. She might even appear on Love Island. She'll be fine. Um, I'm sure she'll be fine money wise after the whole thing goes down. I'm sure of it. Um, fucking Jordan's been able to make an entire career off of you know having fake boobs and being a slag i'm sure she'll work it out not making no f but getting hit by a prisoner on camera Ex no but that's the thing Assad. i think she has an of she just wasn't promoting it again I, I don't know i think uk people are just way more we're not as unapologetically maybe you're not horny we're not as unapologetically like clout chasey as maybe us people her being shy is probably her best her probably her worst trait trying to be reasonable and trying to be like fuck all that shit you're into some degeneracy shit man lean into it forget all this kind of like like fuck all that shit um someone somewhere out there has already busted to that sketch yeah exactly 
Chin needs to go to that jail and get some. <laughs> now, even Chin will fumble in that jail. Chin will definitely fumble in that jail. Chin will definitely fumble. He'll fuck it up for sure. Perry Perry. Yeah, exactly. She was backing it up like that. Perry Perry. I'd give it up on the first date, but we had friends <laughs> for a while anyway, typically. <laughs> Being a coiler, I'd let AZ kiss me, but I'm not smashing. <laughs> Not gonna lie, some some of these some of these victims I had, they had no choice. I'm not gonna lie. Some of these victims I had, they didn't really have a choice. And I'm not saying it in a Delia way or in a Epstein way or in a fucking Bill Cosby way, but let's just say some of my victims had no choice, you know? One one minute I'm here, one minute I'm there. You know what I mean? One minute I'm here, one minute I'm there. <laughs> they didn't really have a choice. <laughs> I believe, I believe in not throwing your shot. I believe in throwing yourself with the shot. That's what I believe in. I'm a believe, big believer in throwing yourself into the shot. <laughs> oh my God. Anyways, 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 anyways. Air, knee, bloody, bloody, bloody ways. So... Let's move on to some streetwear stuff. Courtesy of Hypebeast. Courtesy of Hypebeast. Courtesy of the Blood Clart Hypebeast. So, Hypebeast are reporting. Hypebeast are reporting that the most lucrative, one of the most lucrative pairs of dunks ever, ever made, the Wu Tang dunks, are going to be re released sometime soon. Wu Tang dunks are coming back sometime soon. And those are not the only shoes that are coming back sometime soon. Hypebeast is also reporting. That in 2027, Nike are going to reissue the iconic, the iconic Virgil 10 collection in 2027. So two big sneaker releases, re-releases happening very, very soon. One of them being a great collaboration and one of them being like a marquee dunk that everyone wanted back in the day. The great thing about these type of dunks, if I'm not mistaken, I think, uh, is it Bumblebee or Thunder Rod? I forgot what they're called, but this is that called, this exact colorway, this Wu-Tang colorway in the yellow and black scheme actually did come out as a limited limited edition release without the Wu-Tang embroidery a while back. I'm not too sure how well they originally did, but you know, to get this colorway now isn't as difficult, but obviously the Wu-Tang um, logo on the back and maybe the story behind it is obviously why people want them. But for me, the most incredible thing that I'm also looking forward to more so is the re-release of the Nike 10 collection. This still remains for me, one of the greatest Nike sleeker collaborations of all time especially when you factor in the fact that at this point Virgil was kind of not well regarded as a designer I don't think so and a lot of people were very nervous and were expecting bad results when it was announced that he was collaborating with Nike because I think this is around the time when he was starting to you know take I think this is also maybe around the time that he did that particular collection with Off-White where he spray painted the back of the jackets. No, I think a, a graffiti artist came and spray painted the overcoats and shit. And, you know, everyone was kind of complaining that the quality of clothes weren't great, blah, 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 blah. But a lot of people didn't really rate him as a designer. So to have him kind of design 10 iconic Nike sneaker models, everyone was thinking, oh shit, he's going to fuck this up. But when it eventually dropped, when we saw the, oh, forget dropping, when we saw the process that went into the shoes, when we saw the behind the scene material, his design ethos, that 3% thing, everybody was just, you know, went crazy. And I think this particular Jordan for me symbolized what a great time to be alive because this might've been one of my highest sneaker reselling things I've had in my life. Cause I think if I'm not mistaken, I've never been that lucky with sneakers app when it comes to buying Nike sneakers, never really been that lucky. But for some reason, the Nike 10 collaboration, I was able to buy three pairs of the bread Jordan ones. Three, three pairs. Number one pair I got um, based on a panel discussion. I think it was like with Kim Jones or something. Virgil did a panel discussion with Nike at the 1948 store that I used to work in in Shoreditch. And when you went to that panel discussion, you got given the, the opportunity to buy a pair. So I bought a pair there. Then I got another pair because I because um, of some other panel discussion, and I got another pair through sneakers. So I ended up getting three pairs of the Jordan ones, and I ended up selling them. I think each for like eight hundred pounds or something in cash outside the fucking store itself. So it was a fucking brilliant time to be alive. And that money helped me buy a MacBook. That ended up letting me have that MacBook that I then bought was the one that I used to burn the CDs to go and DJ, design the flyers. Like that legitimately was an important time in my life. Like without that money that I made from reselling that. 
Jordan, I don't think a lot of the things that I was doing, quote unquote, creatively, I would have been able to do. Because there's no chance I was able to afford a, a fucking MacBook off of my retail assistant fucking salary. So that's got a lot of fucking, you know, um, great memories with me in that regard. And just in general, you know, remembering Virgil's legacy and everything he kind of left behind, to have his reissue game would be pretty cool. But there's been people online who have been hating on this and saying that this is a bad thing. And I personally don't think it's a bad thing. I personally think it's a great thing this is happening because it's pretty clear that Nike refused to innovate. Nike refused to innovate. Nike are just stuck in their ways. All they want to do is retro. They don't want to do anything innovative. They don't want to do anything fresh, nothing new. And they're languishing behind some of their smaller competitors, not even bigger competitors. A lot of competitors like New Balance, Asics, Diodora, loads of other companies are now eating away at their fucking market share to the point where now, recently when I went out, I swear to God, recently when I went out, right? And I don't go out often, but recently when I went out, I couldn't spot the amount, like there was way more people wearing Adidas's, New Balance's, Asics, and any other shoe that isn't Nike than I've ever seen in my life. And I went to all the trendy cool bits that young kids hang out in and I saw tons of people wearing anything on their feet apart from Nikes, which to me is proof that they've lost that grip that they had. They had that grip on, I think, my generation of people, but I think the younger kids don't really care too much about what Nike's putting out. It's not that great. It's not that fresh. And they'd rather go to other brands and get other models to kind of mix it up a little bit. So if that's the case and they're not willing to innovate, fuck it go back in the archives and go pull some stuff out that really did move and shift culture and then maybe hope that with those things you can give the designers an opportunity to do some new things because the really frustrating part about it is that most likely they have designers on staff on call in their head office now who are doing cool interesting things they just don't empower them to put those things out they don't give them permission to take chances they don't take risk they don't put their faith in those products they don't put marketing spend behind them they'd rather just retro a fucking air max and send it out to the same bait faces and hope that that thing is going to blow up and it doesn't you have to do something new something fresh and they refuse to do it and they just take their they take their number one position almost like apple i think they take their position in the market a bit for granted and they think no one else could catch up with them but slowly they have which is why you're reading reports of nike's you know q4 you know whatever earnings being down and shit and the funny thing about it was that the nike ceo recently said that he was of the feeling that the reason why nike wasn't innovative was because of their lack of working from home no because they work from home too much and i'm thinking remember thinking about it like what a piece of shit that nike ceo is Imagine blaming people who are working from home for the lack of innovation and for the dip in fucking quarterly earnings of fucking Nike when the actual reason behind it is that the people that you're employing, you're not empowering. You're not giving them the platforms to succeed. You're not providing them with an opportunity to fail. You're not testing out new and interesting things. And the funny thing about it for me, which is really odd, and I've said this ad nauseum on here, Yeezy at Adidas was proof that customers, clients, consumers, people that like sneakers overall are hungry and thirsty for new silhouettes and new shapes Kanye despite his personality despite his political leanings despite the things that he says the people that he offends people were willing to pull that to one side and buy the shit he was offering under the Adidas partnership because at least it was fresh interesting new silhouettes completely different to what you see on the market nowadays so that's why people are willing to give it a chance because why not? At least it's new and fresh and different. If I'm going to spend $200 on a pair of sneakers, I don't want another pair of Air Maxes. I don't want a pair of Air Forces, another pair of Jordans. Please give me something new and something fresh and they refuse to do it. So I'm not surprised to see them going back in the archive because what else do they have? If they're not willing to give people a chance to create new things, go back in the archives and let us re-enjoy these shoes again. And when they do drop, when they do drop, best believe man's buying all 10. Because when they dropped originally, I have to be honest, I hated the Blazers. I hated whatever those Nikes, those Air Maxes were. I hated this particular one here in the top. I hated the Air Max at the bottom. I hated the Converse. But now they're going to come back again. Guess what? Man's buying all 10. Man's buying all 10. Especially if they do them in like a pack of two. Man's buying all 10. I don't give a fuck. So I'm happy that they're re-releasing them. I'm happy to see this is happening because Nike don't have a clue. Because Nike don't have a clue. 
So 2027, wait and see when they do release. Maybe they'll come out uh, actually a lot more sooner than that. But I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we do see Nike decide, please, for the love of God, please, for the love of God, that they decide to bring out some more sneaker releases and collaborations because if they can't innovate, why not go back into the archives and pull out some of the great things they did in the past? Why the fuck not? Why the fuck not? Talking about sneakers, let's move on to some other sneakers due to be coming out very, very soon. This is courtesy of the one and only Salili Bembry, and it features a pair of New Balances that he has debuted on his own social media platform. And we also have Hypebeast providing some of other bits of information regarding these New Balance 530s that he's about to put out soon. Um, personally love the color big fan of neon green lime green one of my favorite colors there's actually a throwing fits samba due to be coming out soon that i want to get my hands on if you know anything about me you love you know i love a bit of safety green neon green it's something that i've always kind of been drawn to and sneakers with it especially all over the upper i'm all over these these in particular it's more of a limey green effect i'm not sure it's a more of a neon safety green um colorway in general but just the details the different application process on the upper the the fluffy suede here at the front you got a nice bit of different suede here on the side paneling you got some nice mesh i think that's a mesh over i think that's maybe it's a plastic or rubbery overlay on top of some mesh um i love the fun print that you have here on the inside of the new balance logo the off-white type of midsole or maybe off-white maybe stained yellow midsole the nice lime green tubular laces a big hit of lime green here at the back just incredibly nice bright summery shoes for the summery season obviously you've got the detail here with the farm logo and on hypebeast you've got some more detailed images of the shoe itself um the hypebeast pictures aren't the best i think Sally Bembry took better pictures of them in natural light i think they look way better here on his instagram profile he actually made them look far more banging than how they did look on the fucking um hypebeast article i'm not gonna lie so the his instagram profile picture he makes or his instagram feed sorry he makes them look way better because they're you know right up in there in some california sun beaming and looking fucking bright and gorgeous as they meant to look and on the hype beast are a bit dull looking um based on this sneaker head i purchased them but still pretty decent for me and something that i would definitely be up for buying but i'm wondering now because he's hit so many shit out of the park when will it come a point where somebody does think you know what i'm going to lock you down I need to wife you up. I need to give you that long max fucking contract so you don't go anywhere else. And you just give us all your best stuff. Give us all your best designs, all your best creative work right now because I can't risk you giving some of your best colorways, your best models, your best whatever to another brand. I wonder when that will happen because at the moment, Teddy Santis is the creative director of New Balance USA kind of right i wonder if there's ever going to be a scenario where maybe silly Bembry does new balance worldwide maybe he does even the uk that might be something that might be on the books and should be considered because he's done so much shit so much great shit especially with crocs um and now with new balance with the colorways that i think they would be remiss if they were to let him slip through their hands because with Teddy Santis, you've got one type of aesthetic, one type of you know approach to colorways and to models picked. And with Sidney Bembry, you've got another one. So you've got these two guys. So if you wanted to, you could have maybe Teddy Santis do it for a period for North America and then maybe have you know Sidney Bembry take over. Or you could have Teddy Santis do the US, the US stuff and let Sidney Bembry do worldwide shit. I'd fucking love to see that. I'm not going to lie. I'd really love to see that. But let's see what happens. Um courtesy of hypebeast just a couple of days ago we caught up with a glimpse of what was expected from the silly Bembry next new balance project with silly Bembry officially teasing the pair in an embedded um, instagram post below additionally the sneakers have surfaced in early pairs but on top of the previously outlined inclusions of the bright yellow forefront throughout the kick sorry the pink serves as an accent colorway around the hill oh it's actually pink around it is that pink not much pink there i guess that mean maybe okay i mean i guess that mean that little logo there the absorb logo and his name tag on the side okay cool pink and neon is actually quite a cool little combo i'm not gonna lie especially maybe if the lining was pink or maybe the underside of the tongue and shit a little hit maybe the pull tab at the back that might have been probably a good little hit cool continue on here 
on top of the very pink the pink serves as an accent color around the hill alongside um the teal or the midfoot and silver branding elements are the toe overlay neither Benbury nor new balance have discussed where the pair will be dropping however it's safe to assume that they will hit the shelves by the end of the year likely via blah 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 so i'm assuming this year um it would be nice if they drop now during the summer because this is a typical summer shoe for me nice and bright proppy fresh colors light materials perfect for a pair of shorts and shit short shorts some free quarter left trousers and shit i think this will look fucking amazing and i'd obviously love to wear them for a holiday trip or something but um if they drop by the end of the year it's still a good thing so great to see another smashing pair of new balances from silly benbury curtis of new balance and i'm wondering who's gonna wife this guy up who's gonna make this guy their man and lock him down on a max contract and tell him you're not going anywhere you're not going anywhere make us all the shoes please we love you make us all the shoes please who's gonna do that i wonder who's gonna do it i wonder who's gonna be the person to lock this man down because he's been doing so much great shit so much great shit that i want to see him get locked down by someone talking about things i don't want to see talking about things i don't want to see i saw this post courtesy of hypebeast and it made me low 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 it's regarding goodhood goodhood allegedly have opened up a second store somewhere in east london um and you know hypebeast is a good little profile on them on there talking about goodhood and you know them being a couple and making the streetwear brand destroy this fashion store um i actually went to their first store when it first opened it wasn't actually in the location that it is in now it was actually at the other end at the top of the street they had this kind of store it's kind of like two floors then they moved and they moved into the location that they're in now which is i think is curtain road or something um personally I've never had the best time shopping in Goodhood, personally, not gonna lie. Um, it's a bit of a vibe killer. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the lady's pretty nice in the couple, but the dude, a bit of a wanker, not a bad thing, just, you know, standard London fashion guy, store owner vibes. Um, you know, a little bit of a, you know, bit of a vibe killer. The lady seems very bubbly and nice though. And the times that I've been into the new store in Shoreditch, you know, it's kind of felt like you're entering someone's house you know what i mean in all the bad sense of the terms as if like you're interrupting them like you shouldn't actually be in there even though it's a shop and they're selling you things it almost feels like you shouldn't really be in there but you know if you know you know so hypebeast did this article about them opening up this um second space in shoreditch that's going to serve as i think like a place where they're gonna you know highlight maybe up and coming brands maybe smaller brands they can't stock in their main store i'm not sure if it's a permanent store it might just be one of those pop-up spaces around brick lane and shit but regardless it's an article you can read it it is what it is but i decided to jump on the instagram and check what's going on with the store because I, I haven't heard about Goodwood in a long time browsing around their fucking instagram and i stumbled across this post that they were at paris fashion week right covering some like skateboarding event with vans because at the moment Paris Fashion Week men's has turned into the de facto bread and butter. It's the bread and butter replacement. Bread and butter back in the day was this streetwear fair sales event thing where all the big streetwear brands, streetwear stores, retailers, whatever would go and share their wares and it would be everywhere where everybody around the world, brands and stuff would go and congregate all the founders and shit and it would be a chance to hang out, have a good time. But then bread and butter kind of folded and now Paris Fashion Week men's has turned into the menswear fashion week, obviously, and also an opportunity for streetwear brands to show off their shit. So a lot of streetwear brands hire out studio spaces and stuff around the place to sell stuff and whatever, have people come in and see their up and coming collections and whatever, um, <coughs> which is an odd mix because if you know anything about the fashion world, especially in Paris, they kind of have a love-hate relationship with streetwear. They sort of like love the energy around it they love the culture they love the vibes maybe a lot of the guys like the some of the skaters and shit right but they kind of despise it because you know it's street in the day it's t-shirts jeans sneakers and shit and a lot of fashion people think if it's not tailoring if it's not been pattern cut in somewhere if the person didn't graduate from a high class university it doesn't count so it's a weird mix anyway all that to say browsing through their feed i stumbled across this particular post here right with the vans founder and um on this particular post somebody made a really funny complaint about the service or lack thereof they've received at, Van at Goodhood. And it made me laugh because it's all well and good opening up second spaces. It's all well and good, um, you know, having these cool spaces where you have all these brands come in and you're doing skateboarding events and bloody blah, 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 blah. But fundamentally, you're a retail store and you sell things. 
And this first comment I saw here was absolutely hilarious. Big up Megan. Big up Megan Maria. So Megan Maria left this post on, left this comment on a post that's to do with their skateboarding activations in Paris with vans. I'm trying to get a response from your customer care who are ignoring my emails for the last two weeks about a return. Please somebody reach out to me. In most cases, if you have to resort to leaving a comment under a post that has nothing to do with your purchase, nothing to do with your return, nothing to do with customer service, to get their attention, it's usually because you've been ignored for a long time. Maybe an, you know, an ungodly amount of time when you have to resort to this level, where you have to kind of like carry yourself on social media and be like, guys, hello, I'm here. Um, I've been emailing for a return. No one's getting back to me. What the fuck's going on? This means you've usually been ignored for a while. So the fact that this Megan Maria person has to leave this post is probably proof to me that the good Hood customer service haven't been doing their job and they've been purposely ignoring her and, you know, doing the kind of customer service that a lot of these fashion brands do where instead of updating you on the status of what's happening, they just ignore you until they've got a solution, which is horrible because any other place that you shop outside of cool stores, fashion scenes, they deal with you like a customer. You buy something, you need you need a return, they answer you quickly. But when it comes to like the cool fashion, menswear, streetwear, fashion scene, whatever, suddenly everyone's a bit more laissez-faire, a bit more cool. Their music is blaring in the store. You can't really hear them when you're talking. You know, the website doesn't really work properly. They say they have 10, but they actually have one. All this sort of nonsense. You have to just deal with it because, you know, that's just the nature of the industry. But there are some times where you just feel like, you know what, bog standard customer service is what you should be doing well. And if you can't do it well, I don't care about your second space you're opening. And imagine this type of response, right? Imagine this type of question or concern from a customer. You'd imagine this would be maybe a little bit embarrassing. Maybe you want to correct it on the spot. Or maybe you'd want to make sure that people that see this know that you're dealing with this customer's response or dealing with their query or you're going to resolve their issue. Look at how good to respond to this lady clearly in distress clearly worried clearly at the point where she's just exhausted all options she's probably rang them a few times sent loads of emails now i've got a reply and thought okay cool if they're in paris and they're posting regularly on their social media it must mean that they're seeing their social media so if i post my concerns under their latest post maybe they're going to reply back to me they do reply back to her but it's not the reply back that you think it is look at how they replied back to this girl that's clearly just wants some help at maria marie no one is ignoring you. We are stretched. Answer coming soon. <laughs> and no one labeled it. No one put their initials. Nothing. Just some cunty, cunty response that, if anything, this personifies what Goodhood is about and personifies what most menswear, streetwear, retailers, especially skateboarding stores, how they like. This vibe where they almost treat the customers like second-class citizens, where they almost treat you like they're chewing up at the bottom of their foot, where they almost treat you like you are inconveniencing them, is a reason why a lot of these stores, when they fail and when they crash down, when they go bankrupt, when everyone loses their job, why I don't have any sense, ounce of sympathy or empathy or whatever when it comes to them failing because most of them fail because they treat their customers like shit not because they do bad selects do bad buying no it's usually because they don't do returns well they treat you like shit when you come in the store they vibe you out they have staff that are like with their back facing you when you walk into the store they have staff outside chilling turning into a fucking stoop so you feel like intimidated they don't want to go in they, you know, they 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 almost roll their eyes when you ask them to get you something at the back of the store. Hey, do you have another size? They almost roll their eyes. They have to go upstairs and check for something for you. They make it seem like they're doing you a favor by doing their job. No wonder these people fail. No wonder they fail. No wonder people run away from their stores and don't want to go anywhere near them. The London thing, though, is interesting and unique. London is unique because we have such a lack of stores that sell the stuff that Goodhood does. They can kind of get away with this, unfortunately. We have so many, we have so little stores in London that sell the type of brands, the aesthetic, the style, who have the type of vibe, the range of things that Goodwood offer, that they are kind of allowed to get away with treating their customers like this. Imagine going on social media and after a customer is actually just trying to get your attention, she hasn't said anything bad, she hasn't put any fucking, you know, there's no caps lock on her fucking post, she's not screaming at you, she's not added fucking crazy angry eye emojis, she's not threatened to report you or anything, she's just said, hey guys, you've been ignoring me, you know who she is also, 
and you say no one is ignoring you we are stretched on to come like who gives a fuck about you being stretched you're not stretched enough to attend paris fashion week by the way you're not stretched enough to go to paris fashion week and to go to a skateboarding activation which is, again is something that i've always fucking hated there was a period in time when i was coming up in the scene right where some of these skatewear skate brand these skateboarding stores especially some of these skater owned stores these sos's right would be right up their own ass acting all high and mighty like they're above fashion like they're above all this scene oh this is lame this is all vapid this is all whatever and now look how the tables have turned many years later now they're all courting and being in a relationship with all these big publications like hype beast and high sobriety they're doing fucking events with good hood and shit they're posing in fucking fashion magazines like wankers all these guys are acting all high and mighty like they were above it are now doing it and now this is the type of level of service that they are fucking imbuing into these stores absolutely diabolical you're out here you know sucking yourself off about this second store that you're opening right somewhere in east london that nobody gives a fuck about but then you can't even do the basics and just get people to you know purchase people's returns whatever get them an exchange get them a re refund whatever it needs to be done it can't just be done properly and people wonder why places like sheen places like timu rep replica fucking stores on fucking Taobao, like people on vintage people wonder why those things are booming because at least they're incentivized to provide good customer service at least they're incentivized to treat their customers well but fashion stores where you're meant to kind of you know you're meant to kind of support them and it's more than just a store it's about the community and the story they treat their customers like this i'm sorry but i don't care what brands you sell if i see you talking to your customers like this on social media i'm never shopping with you ever ever because it's the kind of place where you go where if something goes right you're fine if something goes wrong they're gonna fuck you that's the problem with these type of stores if you know what your size is if you know what your sizing is if you know what color you want yeah if you know what brand like if you know who you you know you're right or you're the type of person who doesn't like returning and i'm that type of person too i can be a bit slow returning i can just sometimes chalk up as an l if i got the wrong size and just you know take the l and just leave in my wardrobe but if you're the type of person that likes to kind of try things on take it back home see if you like it then hey they're gonna make your life a living fucking hell a living fucking hell but take your money they'll take it in an instant open a new store they'll open it in a new an instant wank themselves off about how great they are take it in an instant when it comes to answering your emails and treating you like a good customer nah nah honestly this is one of the things i despise despise so greatly about fashion stores in general the absolute contempt pure contempt they have for the customers drives me absolutely up the wall bro it's a niche you need us there's a finite amount of customers out here that are going to be willing to buy, pay whatever you're paying for a fucking hysteric glamour fucking button up like not many people give a fuck about that japanese brand you kind of need these customers if you've pissed them off then sorry that person that was meant to come season in season that isn't going to come anymore now you've got some 700 short sleeve button up sitting on the shelves for ages like honestly i hate it so much so not surprised to see not surprised to see okay i think that's it i think i've done two hours already two hours of the excellence english show thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual thank you for tuning in if it's your first time tuning into the show make sure if you listen to the audio side of the podcast that you leave me a five star review that'd be greatly appreciated five stars five stars don't be stingy that'd be greatly appreciated if you're watching via the podcast or the sorry the youtube and the live stream then of course click the link at the top of the chat and make sure that you click that up and check that out subscribe and all that malarkey for those who listen to the audio side of the pod and some of you listen to the video side of the pod you will hear my tune of the day my tune today has to come from the one and only mitre i don't know much about mitre i don't know much about mitre i don't know much about this young lady but i do know she makes very sultry very sexy very housey very boppy house well r&b infused house or well, house r&b infused house music and this particular ep she put out called endless nights might be one of my favorite bits of music i've heard this year another contender for me for album ep of the year courtesy of the girl known as mitre my tune today today is going to be a track from this particular ep which is track five called turn me on if you're into Kei Trinada and you like his recent album he just popped out, definitely recommend you check out this EP. But his particular tune, courtesy of Mitre, 
called Turn Me On on her EP called Endless Nights. Might be one of my favourite things I've heard in a long time. So definitely check her out. Mitre, Endless Nights, EP. The track playing for you now is Turn Me On. Thank you so much for tuning into the Agostino Zinga Show. It's been a pleasure and never a chore. Links to all my socials are in the description and all the topics and shit will be listed in the description as well later on. Thank you for checking me out and I'll see you guys again very, very soon.